So the framers of the U.S. Constitution, as we discussed in our previous review, uh, had to balance the powers of Congress and the federal government at the national level with powers held by the states. So where the power ultimately lies, however, uh, has been a source of controversy, as we know, since the U.S. Constitution was ratified and implemented. Uh, the national legislature has stretched its power in trying to address national needs. States have tried to maintain their sovereignty. We see it unfolding right now in the midst of this uh, COVID-19 public health crisis. So we're going to look at kind of how federalism took shape, how it evolved, and how Congress's authority and the modern function have kind of uh, blurred the lines of distinction between what is a state power, what is uh, a national power. So starting just with the definition of federalism, uh, in creating and empowering the new federal government, the framers of the Constitution debated, as we discussed previously, uh, where the power should lie. So they left, they fought a revolution against a uh, someone they perceived as a tyrant, right? So they wanted to move away from that. They wanted to avoid having this idea of centralizing power. So this is where you have federalism emerge. It's the sharing of power between a central government and equally sovereign regional governments, states in our case. Um, and that became a key part of this framework of uh, securing liberty, which the founders saw as important, while also dividing respective powers among multiple authorities. That debate, though, is going to be ongoing, and, and that's one of the things we'll see in Unit 3 in the Civil Rights uh, Unit, right, is that to what extent does the protection of liberty at the national level, uh, how can we balance that with the claim that states have uh, to some uh, degree of uh, sovereignty, right? And as we know, uh, under the original American federal system, the states had much more authority, right? Remember the Articles of Confederation, it was just a firm league of friendship. Um, and the power of the national government uh, in the Articles of Confederation was, was seen to derive from the power of the states. And by that time, every state had its own constitution. Several had Bill of Rights attached to it. All states had a legislature, they had defined crimes, they had courts uh, for criminal trials. Um, so the framers didn't focus so much on those things as they did on things like regulating commerce, building roads, coining money, establishing a, a military for defense, and then defining immigration and naturalization. So uh, what are some of the provisions in the Constitution that kind of define and clarify federalism? Well, it's kind of sprinkled throughout the Constitution. A national needs required consistency across state lines. Uh, that's why you see something like having uniform weights and measures. Uh, that's why you see something as like a national currency. And so to establish this consistency, Article One actually enables Congress to make the determinations on those types of things, to legislate on military and diplomatic affairs so that you don't have 13 different states coming up with 13 different treaties with different foreign countries, allowing states to regulate international or interstate commerce. It also allows Congress to define uh, crimes like counterfeiting, mail fraud, immigration violations, piracy, because those kind of transcend state lines. Um, and that's some of those enumerated powers in Article 1, Section 8. Article 1, Section 9, actually those um, places some limits on what Congress can do. And this is part of the um, compromises that we discussed, where the slavery issue kept getting kicked down uh, the road. Article 1, Section 10 tells states what they cannot do such as entering treaties or impairing contracts. Article 4 deals with, the whole Article 4 deals with relationships among the states, but that's where we talk about full faith and credit, we talk about privileges and immunities, and then of course the extradition of fugitives. But at the same time, Article 6 asserts the supremacy of the national government. States, state laws cannot supersede the Constitution. And then of course, the Ninth Amendment, which says that just because a right's not listed in the Bill of Rights means it's reserved, uh, it's granted to the people. And then uh, Amendment 10 uh, 
says that powers not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the state. So if the Constitution does not prevent a state from acting on something, or if the Constitution does not give that power to Congress, then it can be assumed that the state has that power. Okay. Um, so again, just to clarify some of these things, this whole full faith and credit, protections of privileges and immunities, extradition, this requires that each state um, regard and honor the laws in other states. Um, privileges and immunities uh, essentially says that uh, states uh, can create laws to protect their own uh, residents or to give them priority over non-residents, but the Supreme Court um, said that states have to be careful in taking those kinds of steps, right? You have to be respectful of uh, citizens from every state, and that's where the 14th Amendment is going to be particularly important when it comes into play. Uh, states, uh, though, uh, can charge uh, different college tuition prices, and you all may be seeing this for in-state and out-of-state students. And the interpretation that uh, courts have given that is because, well, in-state students and their families have actually paid into the state's tax system that supports state colleges. So it's not unfair uh, to, to ask of that, uh, of that requirement. And then uh, on the 10th Amendment considerations, uh, one way that we kind of split this power is thinking about it as delegated uh, powers, which are powers that are given to the national government by the Constitution, reserved powers, powers through that Amendment 10 that aren't necessarily specifically listed, um, but remain with the states, um, and then the powers that are held by authorities at both uh, levels of government or the uh, national, state, and local governments are called concurrent uh, powers. So some of these delegated powers, that the things that can happen that the United States government can do, um, declare war, obviously. Uh, states can't do that. Uh, coining money. That's a weakness of the Articles of Confederation. States can't create their own currency. Regulate interstate commerce. Again, another challenge faced by the Articles of Confederation. And then manage immigration and nationalization, right? Um, and defining the standards for that. This is going to be particularly important when we get to the 14th Amendment, Unit 3. Uh, reserved powers to the states. Public health. That's a very important issue right now, uh, what with all of the COVID-19 discussion. But as we'll talk about later, this is an example of where those lines kind of get blurred, right? Because when you have something, the scope of COVID-19 and the global pandemic, it's really difficult just to leave that issue to the states. It's going to have to be something that will involve some uh, federal action, right? Um, just because of scope and because of the technological advances that, that, that we, it's so easy to go across state lines and state boundaries that it's really important to have some consistency there. Safety regulations, um, uh, incorporation of cities and businesses, um, defining legal relationships like marriage, divorce, managing public schools. Um, so states, um, uh, or federalism rather, leaves schools, uh, leaves the administration of election, most law enforcement, all of that's up to the states uh, to decide. Uh, however, there is, as we will see, there is some federal involvement in a lot of those um, realms, right? There's the Department of Education, you have a Federal Elections Commission, you have Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. Uh, so, AFT. So these things uh, have muddied the waters in terms of the federalism debate. It's not as clean cut as it looks because of the complexity of our society today. And then we have concurrent powers. These are powers that they both can do. And we can fill this in if you get a paycheck, right? Taxation. You most likely you will pay federal income tax, you will pay state income tax, and in some instances, local income tax, right? Uh, law enforcement. As I mentioned, we have federal law enforcement officials because we have federal laws, but we also have state and local law enforcement officials because we have state laws, we have local ordinances and court systems. Because they have different uh, laws, they also have different legal systems, they also have different court systems uh, to arbitrate uh, disputes that arise in those legal systems. So we have the federal judiciary and we also have state and local courts. Now, this has always been an issue, 
well, not always. This has been a significant issue throughout our history. This argument of over uh, this the Venn diagram, basically, that I just showed you about what what is reserved to the states, what's delegated to Congress, what can they share, um, and in uh, the early U.S. history in 1788, uh, one of the final acts of the outgoing Confederation Congress, right, was that states should choose presidential electors to vote for the first president under the new constitution. So with Virginia accepting the constitution, ratifying the constitution, uh, it was clear that it was going to be George Washington. George Washington had steered the ship in the Revolutionary War. He had steered the ship in the discussion over the constitutional convention. He had tried to retire multiple times, but the responsibility kind of fell on him. And it was Washington that really oversaw the birth of this federal system. But the federal system that we see under Washington is far different from what we will see in a modern era. And we refer to this, this um, aura that surrounds the Washington presidency as Washington's golden age. He was unanimously elected president. Uh, you know, he had demonstrated leadership at the Constitutional Convention. He had been in an alliance with Madison, Hamilton, and others. So basically, he was a Federalist in all but name only. Uh, because he didn't want to be involved in, in partisanship. And the same group that ra advocated for ratification also uh, advocated for establishing a strong national government, right? Um, the first congressional elections resulted in sending mostly Federalist-minded uh, legislatures to Congress. In fact, only 11 anti-Federalists had the 59 seats in the first house of representatives and there were only two anti-federalists in the 20 member senate so this dynamic in congress and the leadership of washington resulted in mainly a unified federal government that accomplished much during its first term they designed the courts they declared the district of columbia the new capital city they created national financial institutions the national bank we know that, that was a source of division but as Washington and his uh, allies um, started to go in this direction, American politics started to divide into two camps. And the debate was familiar because it was over the national strength versus states' rights and individual liberties, right? And those are some of the same arguments we saw in the Constitutional Convention. They're some of the same arguments we saw during the Revolution. And though political parties, as we know them today, didn't really exist, the Federalists were pitted really against the Democratic Republicans led by Jefferson and then later Madison. We see that in some of the rap battles of Hamilton the Musical. Um, and these showdowns were really centered on the state versus national power and authority. Uh, and one of the first issues that arose, as we know, was the creation of the National Bank. Washington asked both the Jefferson and Hamilton their opinions. Uh, unfortunately, in the actual history, it didn't take the shape of a rap battle, uh, but they did clash very significantly. And Jefferson's argument against the bank was that it was an Im improper because Congress did not have the power under the Constitution to do it. Uh, he argued that the Constitution should be interpreted more uh, strictly, more precisely. And we'll talk in Unit 2 about this idea of strict construction. And he believed that if the Constitution did not permit it, then it would not be allowed. Hamilton, in contrast, believed that the Constitution did not forbid, uh, since the Constitution did not explicitly forbid the creation of a national bank, then it should be permitted. Okay, And Washington ends up obviously siding with Hamilton at the first bank of the United States in 1791. Now, that's all good, well and good. A lot of this was political rhetoric, though, because as we know, when Jefferson became president in 1801, he... Um, bought the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, which was not something, a power that was explicitly outlined for the president in the Constitution, right? So so it's this, this, this balancing game, right? To say Jefferson was a strict constructionist really belies kind of the true history of this. Jefferson's fear, as we mentioned previously, was that he did not want uh, the federal government, the national government, to expand to the scope where it encroaches upon the liberties and the rights of the states and the individual. He saw Hamilton as being an Anglophile uh, monarchist that just wanted to create an American monarchy, monarchy. Now, a lot of this 
debate, though, was tamped down after this controversy over a federal tax on whiskey distillers in rural areas. Opponents said that this tax um, was a overreach of power by the national government. Uh, so much so that the, a group of um, a group of farmers protested in Western Pennsylvania and launched this rebellion. It's kind of the a, a foil to Shays' rebellion. President Washington summoned the militia of several states. Thirteen thousand soldiers rallied to the call, and they easily put down uh, the rebellion. But the incident actually strengthened the anti-Federalist and Jeffersonian faction because it called into question the growing power in the federal government. In fact, Jefferson was appalled um, at, and even some Federalists were, uh, were appalled at the, uh, this display of force against our own, uh, the Americans, people of the United States. So uh, to add fuel to this growing anti-Federalist fire, when Washington retires and John Adams becomes president, barely defeating Jefferson in, uh, in the election of 17, of, uh, in the election of, um, 1786, the, um, Federalist forces kind of, uh, begin influencing Adams thinking, especially in this lead up to, uh, this quasi war with France, Hamilton, who's kind of pulling the strings behind the scenes of the Adams administration, uh, is trying to push the administration in the direction of all-out war. The Federalist Congress passes the Alien and Sedition Acts that allowed the federal government to jail dissenters uh, who went against the government's cause or spoke against the government, allowed them to deport foreigners who they claimed would pose a threat to the United States. Um, so, so this expansion uh, of the national government's power only, again, adds fuel to the fire of uh, the anti federalists who say it violates the First Amendment, and it really is a good source of conversion for Jefferson and his and his political allies. So as Adams administration uh, was gelling detractors, Jefferson responded to the new laws uh, while also developing this larger philosophy called compact theory, which held that the 13 sovereign states in creating a federal government had entered into a compact or contract regarding its power and its jurisdiction. So the states that created the national government and thus could judge whether federal authorities had broken the compact by overstepping that limited authority they granted in the first place. The theory challenged the authority of the federal judicial branch and it challenged the supremacy of national law. So Jefferson and his supporters believed that if the Federalists could stamp out free speech and free press, then they could violate other liberties in this compact. So in doing this in secret, because he wanted to avoid, uh, avoid uh, detection, he wanted to avoid prosecution, he pinned a series of resolutions uh, to address the violation. It became known as the Kentucky and the Virginia Resolutions. And they declared that the states had a right to nullification, the right to declare null and void any federal law if a state thought the law violated the Constitution. Now, the Alien and Sedition Acts expired and Adams left office uh, before they could be challenged in court, right? In fact, Jefferson comes in in the Revolution of 1800, the election of 1800. Um, but the South's reserved right to nullification, a right that had never been upheld in the federal courts, would continue. The seed was planted, and that would lead to the nullification crisis that precedes the uh, Civil War. Okay, so one of the things to think about is this this notion that of social contract, which we've talked about, social contract theory, which typically refers to the individual and their relationship with their government. Jefferson, through the compact theory, applies the social contract not to the relationship between the individual and their government but to the relationship between the state, a state as a political entity, a sovereign state, and the federal national government. Now, the Supreme Court does have something to say about this, right? Basically, uh, John Marshall, as a delegate uh, at the Virginia Ratifying Convention in 1788, said, 
famously has the government of the United States the power to make laws on every subject. And he asserted, again, this was before he was chief justice, that the new federal judiciary would declare it void if there was any law that went against the Constitution, right? Harkening to the notion of judicial review, which is established by Marbury versus Madison. In 1801, uh, John Adams had appointed Marshall as chief justice of the Supreme Court. Um, as Jefferson became president, uh, Marshall and Jefferson were basically became rivals over the issue of federalist uh, states, the federalist versus states rights debate in the beginning of the uh, 19th century. And in 1819, this debate kind of comes to a head in McCullough v. Maryland, which addresses the balance of power between the states and the federal government. So uh, the, the main question here at play is, does the federal government have implied powers and supremacy under the necessary and proper clause and uh, the supremacy clause? So these powers were called into question when uh, another U.S. bank controversy arose. The state of Maryland, among others, questioned the legality of a congressionally created bank in Baltimore where a guy named James McCullough was the chief cashier. The Constitution does not explicitly mention that Congress has the power to create a bank, right? We've heard those arguments before. So Maryland, uh, recognizing the state's authority over everything within its borders, passed a law that required all banks in Maryland, not incorporated by the state, to pay a $15,000 tax. And so the purpose of this law was to force the U.S. bank basically out of the state uh, to overcome the federal government's power. McCullough refused to pay, and the state brought the case to the uh, to court, and it made it to the Supreme Court, right? So really, there are two central questions here. Can Congress create a bank? And two, can a state levy a tax on a federal institution? So Article 1, Section 8, is where the court turned to answer this uh, the first question. It, it contains no express power for Congress to create a bank. Maryland and other strict constructionists argued that if it does, doesn't say Congress can create a bank, then Congress can't create a bank. But the court said, well, wait a minute. It says Congress can coin money, right? It says Congress can borrow money. It says Congress can collect taxes and determine laws on bankruptcies and punish counterfeiting. So the court said that sounds a lot like banking stuff. So banking was therefore very much in the federal government's business, and supporters argued that a bank was appropriate under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. It was an implied power. We could infer from the Necessary and Proper Clause that if Congress can do all of these other things relating to banking, then they can establish a bank. Okay. The second question, can a state tax a federal institution, uh, they invoked both the Elastic, the Necessary and Proper Clause, and the Supremacy Clause in Article, uh, in article 6. It's the first time the court had referred to this. The court denounced the state's attempt to tax the, uh, the government, the national government, saying that the power to tax involves the power to destroy, and it broadened what Congress could do, denoting that it's implied power in the Constitution, those not specifically listed in the Constitution, but deriving from the Necessary and Proper Clause, uh, that any constitutional federal law will override state law. So because the federal law, because it was within the constitutional authority of Congress to establish a bank, that authority supersedes any state law because of the supremacy clause. Okay. Remember, McCullough v. Maryland is one of our need-to-know Supreme Court cases. And then that brings us to this whole dual federalism uh, versus cooperative federalism, right? Uh, so dual federalism is where the roles are clearly defined, uh, clearly divided among the federal, state, and local governments, right? Uh, as it says, the federal government exercises powers granted to them under the Constitution with little interference from the states, and then state governments exercise power granted to them under the Constitution with little interference from the national government, okay? Now, uh, the uh, an example would be in Article One, Congress is entitled to legislate in commerce among the states, uh, while it did not forbid the states from regulating commerce within their borders. 
right? So one layer, Congress regulates commerce among the states, interstate commerce, and then another layer, states regulate commerce within their borders. Okay. And Chief Justice Marshall said that states still had some rights to commerce, right? He rejected exclusive national authority over internal commercial activity. This is something known as selective exclusiveness, right? A doctrine that asserts that only Congress may regulate when the commodity requires a national uniform rule. Okay. Now, for years, this system worked because commerce and trade were mainly local. Fewer goods cross state lines than they do today. Uh, so Congress's uh, relative inaction in regulating commerce until the Industrial Revolution allowed for dual federalism to prevail. But as the nation's businesses, manufacturing, transportation, communication, as all that advanced, Congress became more and more interested in legislating business matters. Uh, you had the progressive reform movements, organized labor, reformers, who focused on a national agenda on regulating railroads, factories, banks, breaking up monopolies. So on some occasions, the federal government ended up crossing into states' domain on the strength of the Commerce Clause, uh, which is probably the most frequently contested congressional power. But on some occasions, like as we saw in the slaughterhouse cases, uh, they weren't successful. So as I said, you know, this dual federalism kind of worked until society grew a little bit more uh, complex, right? And uh, you had the 16th Amendment, which created a federal income tax and expanded Congress's reach of regulation. Uh, the 17th Amendment made senators accountable to people instead of state legislatures. And then voters started putting reformers in office who kind of wanted to blur the lines, right? They realized that states leaving this free-for-all patchwork quilt of systems was not really productive in helping the worker, the working class of the United States. So we have this cooperative federalism emerge as society advances and technology improves, which is where the power of the federal, state, and local governments overlap. Uh, government programs can be carried out jointly, or state programs have to follow certain government uh, regulations and uh, mandates. Which then brings us, and part of cooperative federalism is this increase in uh, grants and funding. So the overlap of federal and state authority in these exclusive and concurrent powers uh, is pretty obvious in these grant programs. So in advancing the constitutional definition of federalism, Congress has dedicated itself to uh, addressing national issues with federal dollars, right? So Congress collects federal tax revenues and distributes these funds to the states to take care of what they consider national concerns. Okay, this process uh, is typically called revenue sharing or fiscal federalism. For decades, the federal government has encouraged and at times required states and localities to address safety, crime, education, and civil rights. And Congress does this by directing federal funds to states that qualify for aid. So these grant and aid programs um, have picked up steadily since the progressive era and especially since the New Deal and then uh, Lyndon Johnson's President Johnson's Great Society program in the 1960s. So the financial aid helps states take care of basic state needs uh, and grants come uh, with different forms and different requirements. You could have block grants, right? And these grants are issued um, in a uh, essentially a lump sum, right? Where there aren't strings attached, there, uh, there is flexibility uh, with how states use these grants. Uh, there could be broad parameters, so they could say, well, use this for education, but then they have flexibility to do it. Think of the COVID situation. The, the CARES Act actually cr establishes a fund, a governor's relief fund, that gives the governor some discretion, uh, the governors of each state some discretion on how to administer those funds. That would be an example of a block grant, right? Now, the restriction is that it's, it's used to... Um, address the economic impact of COVID-19, but it doesn't specify which sector of the economy or where those funds exactly go, as opposed to categorical grants that are federal money given to the states with quote unquote strings attached. So there are conditions on those, uh, the, those are um, 
uh, conditions, grants with particular congressional guidelines or requirements, things that states have to do uh, with that money that they are given. Okay. So the um, example of that, uh, you know, we have uh, under the CARES Act with COVID-19, we have uh, a fund for school, for public schools, educational relief for public schools. So that money is going to K through 12 public schools and public schools can only use those funds uh, to offset costs that were caused by the COVID-19 crisis. So school districts have to track how much money we've spent as a result, anything related to COVID-19, and then uh, can use those funds to offset those costs. So there has to be a clearly a defined uh, paper trail in that regard. Okay. And then uh, the other thing that we'll often talk about that you'll hear us talk about when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to uh, federal funding is uh, mandates, right? So this means that the Congress can pass a law in its domain uh, that requires states to act in a certain way or that regulates the behavior of states. And these can be funded or they can be unfunded. And you often will hear the term unfunded mandate. So that's when the Constitution imposes a, requirements on, a requirement on states, but they don't pay for it. Uh, there was a lot of controversy with this on the uh, real ID. The issuing of driver's license and photo IDs is something that's in the domain of the states. After some security concerns with 9-11, Congress passed national legislation that imposed uniform requirements on state IDs. But then states had to pay for the cost of producing those IDs and of distributing them, of, of, and of establishing, getting the equipment in order to print them, so forth and so on. Um, special education laws are often funded, right? So you have uh, you have funding to uh, federally funded uh, programs in K through 12 public schools that uh, are designed to support uh, students with special education needs. Even though education is an issue that is up to the states, uh, that is something that um, Congress feels is important to regulate because it's really a, an, an equity issue, right? So moving on here, some key terms that you'll come across when we talk about federalism, you have fiscal federalism, which is the pattern of taxing, spending, and providing federal grants to state and local governments, right? So it's, it's, it's all these things that we've been talking about, right? Um, uh, post New Deal, the trend of fiscal federalism has uh, experienced mixed reactions from state and local administration. Uh, conservatives push to reduce federal taxes and return uh, state and local control over reserved powers. Um, uh, revenue sharing is not something that they appreciate, and that's a situation where there's both local and federal funds for programs. Sometimes the federal government will do matching dollars. Um, new federalism uh, is something that was pushed by uh, Ronald Reagan as president, where Essentially, um, it was a return to more distinct lines. It was a return to more of this dual federalism and a devolution, which is our next term, of power to the states. And that's a, where uh, the whole less is more approach from the, from the federal government, right? Uh, you know, an example of uh, some of this criticism of that, even though that the federal government has... Uh, doesn't have authority in some of these reserved power to the states, they use their funding authority to compel states to act in certain ways. Um, so an example of a categorical grant in the early 1980s um, was a way to both satisfy and upkeep the highways and ease uh, address the national drunk driving problem. Uh, problem. Congress offered large sums of money in states uh, for highways for the maintenance of highways on the condition that states increase their drinking age to 21. So even though drinking age was not really a, was not a delegated power of Congress, uh, the disbursement of those highway dollars, that was something that was in their power to do. And they tied it though to, uh, to the state's drinking age. So if a state wanted to deny the federal dollars, they could, but, uh, very, no state wanted to do that because that was a significant pot of, um, of money. 
Now, some examples. Uh, how how does how does federalism look? Um, obviously, environmental regulations are uh, going to play um, uh, come under a lot of discussion and debate when when we're talking about federalism. Uh, the Clean Air Act, uh, which was passed in 1970, set requirements and timetables uh, for dealing with urban smog, acid rain, toxic pollutants. Um, in fact, uh, the uh, uh, Clean Air Act amendments imposed about 250 to 300 million dollars annually, uh, uh, and the cost of motor vehicle law would be about of uh, the motor vehicle portion would be about 100 million dollars, um, and these mandates and requirements, uh, while they tested the bounds of federalism, they were seen as important because something like environmental regulations, that does have not only national but global impact. So even if you have an industry that is only located in a state, if it is contributing to environmental pollution or the pollution of the waterways, then it's certainly a interstate problem. Another example, of course, is uh, public education, right? The Constitution and the federal government left the creation and management of schools largely to the states until the 1960s, right? There's always been a national concern for an educated citizenry, but the racial desegregation of public schools, Cold War competition with the Soviet Union in the 1950s, this caused education to move up to the national agenda. And with that move came this new debate about the roles of central state and local government. President Johnson was a former teacher, and he spearheaded the passage of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. And that law not only went after poverty, but it also reformed education. It was a way to ensure that lesser funded schools received adequate resources. And state officials uh, generally welcomed the law because the federal government's uh, hands-off approach uh, heretofore um, uh, basically gave uh, local officials broad discretion on how to spend these federal dollars. In fact, by the end of Johnson's term, uh, federal aid to education uh, totaled about $4 billion. And then by the late 1970s, Congress created uh, the Department of Education, um, which became part of the president's cabinet. The 1980s and 1990s, presidents and members of Congress found education a topic that, you know, all voters cared about and wanted to improve it. Um, so the most sweeping change in federal education law uh, that caused this tension between state and national governments came in the form of the No Child Left Behind Act in early 2002. So the new law actually was bipartisan, right? And it declared that every child can learn and that schools and states should be held accountable for student learning. Accountability was the big buzzword. It called for quote unquote highly qualified teachers and the core subjects in every classroom. Uh, the use of proven teaching methods by people who really hadn't spent a lot of time in the classroom, uh, and then the threat, the threat of sanctions on underperforming schools and oversight and school takeovers and all of this. It pushed for classroom lessons and methods uh, that were consistent, a common uh, core of standards, and uh, wanting to have, give parents in the community uh, information about their schools through these accountability tests. And with all of these requirements and rewards came greater emphasis on testing, uh, interventions. It required the students show annual yearly progress. Uh, and public support for the law initially was widespread. But as uh, teachers, administrators, and state governments started to see its implementa implementation, they became frustrated with it. And part of the frustration was that Congress provided only 8% of the total funding for education nationwide. And yet, it increased the Department of Education's power over the nation's schools and imposed all of these requirements. That's what an unfunded mandate is. Nearly 80% of schools under No Child Left Behind would be labeled failures because they could not reach these idealistic goals, right? Uh, in fact, it, some uh, education experts called it the single largest expansion of federal power over the nation's education system in history. Okay, and the Obama administration started to roll some of this back, but they had this initiative called Race to the Top in 2009 that offered incentives for states to adopt new national standards or develop their own that uh, required this college and career readiness at graduation. 
So the federal government tried to revamp the law, but you still had these Tenth Amendment concerns about it was encroaching upon the uh, encroaching upon the rights of states. Others, though, especially civil rights groups, are pointing to the the uh, to equity uh, and achievement gaps. Um, and advocates for uh, students of lower socioeconomic status saw the need to keep the federal government involved as kind of a watchdog. So more recently in 2015, Congress passed the Every Student Succeeds Act. And under this law, uh, the, the challenging, almost impossible bar for No Child Left Behind was removed. And then states are free to determine their own standards for educational achievement while upholding protections for the disadvantaged students. However, the Department of Education still has to approve each state plan, uh, but ultimately more powers devolved at the state level. So it continues to be kind of this push and pull uh, dynamic. And then, of course, the last example, and the only reason I go into that le length of detail about education is that's one of the illustrative examples that the College Board wants you to be aware of when we talk about federalism. And the last example I'll leave you with, of course, because it's relevant to right now, is COVID-19. Remember, President Trump has come uh, uh, under some criticism because uh, the argument over whether do local governors, do state governors have the authority to shut down businesses and reopen businesses, or can the president step in and say, hey, states, open things back up for business. Our economy needs it. How do you balance public health concerns, which public health is a reserved power for the states, versus the national economic concerns. And, and of course, the, the president has kind of walked back some of his comments about saying, well, the president has total power and said, well, we can recommend to the governors, but ultimate authority rests with the governors. And that's one of the challenges we've seen with COVID-19, right, is that you have different states responding in different ways and at different times. So Governor Bashir here uh, acted relatively quickly in shutting down businesses, shutting down public facing businesses, shutting down bars and restaurants, for shutting down schools. Other states have done that. At this point, there's a state of emergency in all 50 states. So this is an, another example. This is what your FRQ will be about of where do you draw the line, right? At what point? This is a global health pandemic. So if you have a governor that's going to come forward before the public health experts recommend and say, okay, hey, look, this is having a bad impact on my economy. Let's go ahead and open things back up and you have public health experts warning us that that's not the best thing to do, to what extent does the federal government have the power to step in and say, wait a minute, yeah, the governor, you do have the right to open things back up, but these are the public health considerations we have to think about. What powers does the federal government have to address this issue? So as you can see, look, even in 2020, these issues persist to the present day. So. These are some things to think about with the issue of federalism. Again, it's a debate and argument that's been around from the very beginning. Um, and, you know, you know, we talked about the Constitution and the debates surrounding the Constitution, uh, but those debates certainly continue on in to the present day, particularly as it relates to the balance of power between state and local governments and the federal government, the national government. If you have any questions, reach out to me and let me know. But that concludes our review for Unit 1.